further ado, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And as usual, first order of business is approval of uh, minutes from the last meeting, and those will be from February 1st, 2021. Is there any discussion, any discussion or corrections? All right, then we'll, we'll take the meetings as submitted or minutes as submitted. Um, Kathy, it's all yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope that you got to enjoy a little bit of the beautiful weather. Um, we're going to start off with facilities uh, this evening. Uh, the first one on our list is uh, Mr. Henry with an intercom uh, update for you. Okay, it looks like you're driving there. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we had some discussion about our situation with our intercom systems and just what options were available. As we're moving forward, I am bringing back to you a, a much different, a much different solution than than originally offered. Go ahead. Um, we did still select the Roland Telecenter U solution, which is a system that will give us not only intercom system but access via, um, you know, web a web portal um, and mobile devices to let us access our communication and mass notification within our buildings. And go ahead. This is, this is really what we're looking at doing. An important factor I believe you may recall is that over the summer or last year, we did submit for the school safety and security grant to to fund upgrades to the intercoms really throughout the district at one point. Well, we ended up only getting $40,000 in meritorious awards. We did not win any of the competitive funds. Therefore, we have $40,000 in grant money that we need to spend towards the intercom system, but no additional funds were were achieved this year, if you may recall, at the beginning of the year, our high school system actually failed and was in need of replacement. Barry and Eric and I worked together on that one. And what we actually did is we put in, installed a new master clock and a paging solution to offer strictly paging and new bell and clock solutions. So that is actually, installed and running. Again, very basic, but it is in place. We're proposing for the summer of 2021, specifically June 21, to install a solution at the middle school, and that will be that Telecenter U solution, but we're doing it as an analog solution utilizing the existing speaker and the existing speaker wires. Um, for any of our other buildings, at this point, we're putting those on hold as we look at, you know, the total scope of our buildings and what we're doing across the board and anticipate that should we do anything at any of those buildings at that time, we would be looking at upgrading those solutions. Okay. So, so I just wanted, this was the original slide we showed before and I kind of wanted to highlight just what we're, what we're offering different, of course, the master clock and bell system will all be new. That'll be upgraded. It'll have web and mobile connectivity to, to perform things such as lockdowns, the um, classroom statuses and the reporting system that's in there, as well as it'll give us two-way intercom system on top of the phone systems that we have in place. Again, the significant from a security standpoint is that whole call and um, check-in option, and I'll cover that some more. And then this will integrate the intercom system, the access control and the telephone. We won't be doing any integration with the security system and integration with digital displays, um, a district-wide integrated solution and replacing all the mechanical clocks. 
are pieces that we will we'll not be doing in this proposal. Okay. I just wanted to show you brief. Before you move on, are those missing elements going to be proposed later on or are those permanent cancellations? At some point in the future, you know, it's certainly, we, we can look at adding um, the digital display component. I think at this point, we may be very happy just sticking with the mechanical clocks at this point uh, until we have, you know, a need to actually put in digital displays for that. We certainly like to see more digital displays throughout the district and at the middle school. So I think that will be, be growing components, but at this point, we're just leaving them out. Thank you. And this is the part I just wanted to cover. And this is what really made this more than an intercom system and a really a security system as part of that PCCD grant. And that is, we're actually going back and adding sort of the old fashioned intercom buttons in the classroom. And you can see, I have those buttons that say emergency or check-in. And what the teachers can do is, of course, if there's an emergency in their classroom, they can hit that button, the office will be notified. And um, the, of course, the intercom system will open up to allow two-way communication. Likewise, if there's a lockdown situation or anytime we're trying to get a status of the building and the situation in the classrooms, the office can initiate a check-in sequence that they can essentially pull all the classrooms to ask what condition that that classroom is in. And if they click the check-in button, then that will show that that classroom is all clear. If they fail to hit the check-in button, of course, we're concerned that there's something wrong in that classroom that's preventing them from doing that. What we have in this picture here is in addition to the buttons, we're going to put the lights in, as you see on the right side there. And the little circles on this map are a layout of places that Dr. Snedden has identified to put those lights in so that if an emergency first responder or the principal were walking around the building, they'd be able to identify if all the classrooms in that particular area have checked in is all clear. So someone walking through the building can more quickly identify problem areas, okay? And then here's just some costs that we were looking at. Originally, I presented you with uh, the two solutions on the right-hand side, and the one on the far right is the full IP solution, um, the Rollin integrated solution, and then here what we're coming back with right now is just the intercom and the check-in solution. Again, all the electronics, all the digital equipment to run the system is all in place, but we're going to put bridges in from the IP technology to power, like I said, the individual classroom speakers, as opposed to making that all, you know, all new speakers and all new network components. Like I said, from a redundancy standpoint, I see an advantage here in the fact that Again, because our primary communication in these classrooms run over our IP network, actually we're using the traditional wire gives us a true secondary backup. And at this point, um, you know, the cost is dramatically less too. To lower the cost and make this pretty much in line with the $40,000 in grant money that we had, we also are, Barry and I spoke and we're going to be working to do some of the work ourselves to like put those switches in the, the wall plates that are actually existing in the classrooms now and connect the, um, the status lights, the, all the connections for all the speakers in the head end and all of that will be done by the vendor. 
So that's what I have to show you. We are looking and hoping to move forward on this. As I said, the grant money um, we're looking to expend by June 30. And so I'm hoping this, this proposal can be moved to, to the planning meeting for actual vote so that we can, can get that started. What questions do you have for me? Vince, would you expect if, if we did the other uh, four schools, it would be on the order of 50K a school and, I, and integrate, you know? The, it, it would go both directions. Certainly the high school, to put that system in the high school, we're looking at a bit more. Um, you know, I would guess maybe in the 70,000, maybe slightly more than that range the for the other buildings again it, it depends on the classrooms so each one of them the other four elementaries would be slightly less the middle school will support about 70 classrooms so that's not enough for the high school and you them in blocks of 24 so okay thanks Mr. Sears, you're muted. Other questions from board members? Vince, I, I'd like to ask a couple things. First of all, looking, looking at the Rowland and Atlas Global, were those functionally equivalent? Well, this one, like the, the, the items that we listed that we did not do are the, are the components that are missing. Functionally, uh, what let's we're Let's start having, at a higher level. Looking at, at the, the third and fourth columns, are those functionally equivalent? Oh, those two? Yeah. Yes. And that's what we have looked at before. Correct. And like I said, right. what we are proposing is the Rollin Telecenter U, that center column. Right. Um, so in other words, as a matter of um, consideration for the board, we can eliminate Atlas Global from the conversation, correct? Correct. All right, so then, then we're looking at the 427-381 as the estimated cost of the full system for all six buildings, right? That would, correct. That, that there's a couple considerations there. The one is, I believe that's the full IP system, mm -hmm. which I'm not proposing at this time. So but it we is are what proposing you proposed it. before, correct? Correct. But so that was the full from IP. Four hundred thousand to forty thousand. What are we giving up from a functional standpoint? Is there additional risk? Um, it, that's a huge difference, Vince. Well, now hold it. It's it's not four hundred to forty because I'm saying I'm not doing five other buildings. It's it's forty one thousand to do one. No, I get that. Is it? <laughs> Should we then have something that tells us when or if these others are going to be rolled out? I'm not saying let's not consider the second column, but I'm concerned that we're taking an awful lot of stuff off the table that was on the table before and was justified before. My thinking is that, again, I did not want to bring a lot of capital projects at this point as as we're looking at a total assessment of all of the systems. I'm hoping that anything we do moving forward, certainly at any of the elementary buildings are part of a bigger plan for each of those buildings. Okay. This was a little bit out in front on that. So we're, we're pulling back and saying, we're going to address the two buildings that had issues, which is the high school and the middle school. Mm -hmm. the, high, the high school we put in the basic intercom solution. That does not have the security features where they can, again, they we can have the buildings check in, the classrooms check in and be able to initiate those lockdowns like that. So that piece is absolutely missing. And again, I any of those features that are additional features and functionality at this point 
I'm just proposing that we look at as part of a bigger picture, especially looking at, you know, how we had the, the board, bleh, we had the, the door project and it's like, we decided to hold off on that, looking for, you know, a greater plan at those buildings. I'm saying at this point, let's hold off on these for the same reasons. But for the middle school, we need to move forward because I have grant money to expend. And um, I feel very good about the core of the system and using, like I said, using the existing analog, analog speakers and things in place. I think that is actually prudent. We are staying with the conventional mechanical clocks but everything that we're controlling them with has all been upgraded, which that's one of the things we saw at the high school. When we replaced that master clock where we thought we had problems throughout, it really was focused just around that master clock issue. So yes, I don't know that this is a 10 year plan at this point, but I hope that any any enhancements we make at the other five buildings will be part of a, a grander plan. So, so along those lines, if we came back and we actually made a decision about what we're gonna do with schools and everything and said, Vince, we wanna use capital money to do the rest of the schools, that would essentially be the middle column except not IP based, correct? Correct. I would say, you know, we're probably looking at least you know, 20, 30% off of that. Okay. But, but it's not, not redoing what we're, what we're spending now with this grant money. Correct. I would keep that in place. The parts that are missing at the middle school is really just the digital display component. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Instead of having a visual board, like an LED board is actually what Roland uses there or a third party board. We're just using analog clocks and we do not have a visual display in the room. Just a quick question for you, Vince. Um, the 40,000 grant money, is this the, I mean, were there a couple of different projects you were assessing or, or maybe uh, <clears throat> Dr. Williams, were there other projects that were in line and this is the highest, uh, this is the one that bubbled up to the top? It, well, this, there's so much grant money right now. <laughs> I don't want to get confused on those things. This was a, a competitive grant and a meritorious grant, a PCCD grant that was for, what we did in the 1920 year, are rewarded for the 21, 22 school year. Wait, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Yes, this is this is the school safety grant. Um, and so that came that came out part out of the um, most recent uh, school safety initiatives after the school shooting. Um, so this was awarded um, in the 1920 school year. It didn't roll out until 2021. This is what we kept from the money we gave back. No, no this, yeah, this is, I, I understand that. I, this what is I'm actually the following is, year. What are the yes, parameters I, on, on its usage? In other words, is it kind of, this is the only project we can do with it or what else was looked at? And, and yeah, if you tell that, me that this is the best project, I, look, I, I don't need to delve into it any further. We, it is the project that the grant was written for. Okay. Um, and at that time, we felt it was, it was an excellent use of funds because down the road, we saw it as something we were going to address anyway. And we had the opportunity to add these safety components that honestly, we just would not have added, you know, had we going, gone with strictly upgrading the intercom systems. But so again, if, we spend, if we spend this money, there's no tail to it. In other words, we have the option to do that center column. There's nothing that's saying we're committed to doing anything incremental with the 40,000, right? I'm that, going to say correct to that. I believe I yeah, understood that, the that's, question. That's correct. We tried okay. to 
we try to get the full amount funded through the competitive portion and we weren't awarded that portion of it. We're, we're not signing on to like a, a, a 10 year agreement for security monitoring or, or no. we're linking ourselves into some expenditure that we're gonna see going forward, right? No. Actually, okay. that that's a major reason that we went with the Rollin Telecenter U because many systems, including the Atlas one, while it's, you know, looks sleeker, Yes, there's annual maintenance and there's software subscriptions that go with it. The Rollin program is once and done. Once you bought into it, it's paid for. There's no recurring costs as far as licensing um, required maintenance or anything like that. Cool, thank you. I, I have a question, Vince. Um, we were given some paperwork um, uh, prior to the meeting and does this price include all kinds of, of equipment, but it does not include certain other things. Is that, are we gonna have money for that? Or do we think we'll have a problem disposing of any old equipment or labor? And do we have enough of, of our, are we gonna have enough time this summer with our own in-house staff to actually do this work along with other things that need to be done during the summer? That's kind of um, a multi part. And I'll let Barry chime in. Barry and I had a conversation about that and we feel very comfortable that, you know, between our departments, we will be able to get the amount of work done that we need to. All the wiring and everything is in place. What we have to do is, you know, physically make the connections for those plates. And we will need to run some wire for those 12 lights. Um, other than that, everything else is in place. And I'm, with the exception of some unforeseen speakers, you know, that, that may be bad. But we would know that if that were the case now. So... I'm, I'm comfortable. The labors, again, that will be a contract. So from the contractor's perspective, you know, their time is in the contract. They have to get it done with the dollar amounts that they specified. We believe we spec'd all the equipment correctly. So again, I'm, I'm not anticipating any other additional okay. costs. I, I just don't want to see anything, you know, large. I'm sure there are going to be other, you know, miscellaneous costs and we didn't find this and we need that. But I just want to make sure there aren't going to be any substantial uh, labor costs or equipment costs or disposal costs. Um, I'm very comfortable with the due diligence that we did. And so okay. good. Thank you. And I will add in, yes, I do. We did meet with Vince. I did meet with Vince and I feel very comfortable that this is a project that we can handle this summer, um, especially since we've delayed the door project. That'll save us some additional time. So yeah, I feel very comfortable that we can supply whatever labor he needs. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Vince. You're welcome. So Mr. Sears, we're looking for the committee to make a, re make a recommendation to the full board to move forward with, um, with this project at the May, April 12th uh, meeting. All right, and would that include um, some way or other an authorization for the additional $3,800 that's above and beyond the grant? Yes. Okay. Do you see that coming from capital or from O&M? Uh, I see that coming from general. Okay. Thank and, you. And for the record, the, the $1,900 at the high school has already been spent. Um, <laughs> that project was finished in the fall. So we're looking for 41,912? That yes. is correct. Okay. Uh, committee, how do you feel about moving that forward? Run with it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely go for it if we're going to get it done this summer. Mike? Mr. Toman on board? Yeah, he's muted though. Oh, Mike, you're muted. Yes, I'm on board. Okay, Kathy, run with it. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll add that to the board agenda for Monday's meeting. Uh, so we'll move on to finance, um, and we have the 21-22 food service budget. Uh, Nicole worked with Winston on developing the budget for next year for food service. Um, and so we have Nicole doing the presentation, and then Winston is here to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, Nicole. All right, you know, we'll wait for it to come up. 
Okay, um, you can see we split it out by the revenue and the expenditures. The revenue were down a little bit, 4.63%. And that's because due to um, kind of industry and looking at things, some of the students that may not be coming back who are going to charter school or other kind of learning that will not be in our building. So we accounted for that. So therefore that um, made a difference between our 2021 proposed budget and approved and then our 21-22 proposed budget. So that is why we're down in our revenue, which also takes into consideration the reimbursement for our state reimbursement, which is down 21.79%. But then with the federal, we're getting a little bit extra federal. Um, they're foreseeing about seven cents additional federal reimbursement that we will be getting. So that has increased the amount of federal reimbursement we're getting. So we will see a total um, decrease in revenue of 4.63%. But in the expenditures, we're going to see a decrease of 5.26%. So our total food service budget, we were actually looking at a profit of $128,000 and 53 cents. Um, Woodson's has guaranteed the district $125,000. Um, so for in some of the expenditures, that you can see um, the food costs, obviously, because we're not going to be serving this amount of students, the food cost has gone down. Um, the commodity charge, that is something set by the USDA, so that's not really governed by us. That's just those charges that we get charged. And um, the software license, that is an increase because we have two different systems now, so that is why it's showing as a 279% increase. It's just because I'm showing it the two separate systems. So it, that's why it's showing that percentage increase. So does anybody have any questions? Okay. If there are no questions, we'll move on. We'll also have this on the board agenda for Monday uh, for the approval of the food service budget, as well as the renewal contract for Winston's for the 21-22 school year. The next item on the finance section is the insurance reserved. Um, and we've talked about this several times in either uh, planning meetings or other facility meetings. Uh, property and finance meetings. Um, and this is the topic of moving the insurance money from general fund to the insurance fund. And so currently we have $2.4 million sitting in the, in, in the general fund for healthcare purposes. This was a combination of a uh, cash that was sitting in the account when we opened up the, the insurance fund, as well as some uh, money that we had in reserves uh, due to prior year's holiday fundings. Um, and so we want to move the insurance money to the insurance fund for the purposes of uh, handling bad claim years. Um, and if we, if the board approves this, this would be an interfund transfer between the general fund to the insurance fund. Any discussion? Okay, Kathy, I guess that goes on the agenda then. Okay, we'll add that to the agenda. Okay, the last item we have is the budget. At the last voting meeting, uh, we showed a budget uh, with projections of uh, $227,569 as our deficit. And that was using uh, a 1.9% tax increase and a use of fund balance of 300,000. Since then, we've made several changes to the budget. Um, 
we uh, asked different departments to look at their budgets um, and we've made some reductions of $282,786. And then we updated our federal programs allocations um, to actuals and that was another $4,000. So currently we're sitting at projected revenues at $63,072,443 and expenditures at $63,012,937 with a deficit, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a deficit, is an excess of 59506 Essentially what this would mean is that we would either uh, lower the amount or use less fund balance. So instead of using the 300,000, we would use less. Or the other option is that we could um, decrease the uh, tax increase that we are currently using. Um, and so we also wanted to show the budget projections as we stand currently today. So assuming that 2021 ends with a 1.7 use of fund balance, um, we would carry, we would end our reserves with 9.7 million. Our revenues and expenditures would come out to 244,000, which is the less than 300,000 that we would use for pension reserves, from pension reserves. Um, and then we would carry forward um, for those year, the, the following years. Now, none of my projections have changed since um, the last meeting. So we're still assuming that in years 22 to 23 and moving forward that we would increase taxes at the projected IFO Act 1 index, uh, that we would see flat funding in state outside of PISERS and uh, FICA reimbursements um, and flat funded in federal programs. On salary and expenditures, we do see increases in salary and, uh, and benefits, and as well as 2% in other areas. So everything outside of salary and benefits, we've increased those categories by 2%. Um, and you'll see that in 22-23, we have a projected deficit at 2.3, 23-24, a 2.5, 24-25, a 2.8, and a 3.5 uh, at the 25-26 school year. That is using the assumptions that we have been making up until this point, a 1.9% tax increase in the 21-22 school year, and a use of reserves of $244,783. And so I'll open up the floor for discussion. Kathy, first I wanna just get a clarification. 1.9 is the assumed tax increase. It, it's the assumed tax increase that we've been using. Okay, and what, what was the reserve? Uh, we, I'm sorry, for the, the retirement reserve, how much was that again? We were set to use 300000 Is that what, what's showing here? What was the 244 you just mentioned? The 244? Yeah. It's That's 244 what, because we cut expenditures. And so those expenditures um, were under the, in, the, the revenues. And so... Instead of using three hundred thousand, we would use two hundred and forty-four thousand. All right. I, I have a question. I'm not sure um, where we stand. Uh, there was some question about the replacement of the high school English teacher. Um, is that budgeted? Are we still hopeful about that or where do we stand? Um, that was a request that was made um, and did not, was not granted through the administrative review of the budget. 
And so that happened back prior to the March 8th meeting. Well, now, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I understood that there was a word from administration that we were hopeful we might be able to regain that through some, I don't know, moving around of teachers or... Oh. Yes. I, we're, we're working on uh, a few things, actually. Uh, but the one that you're referring to is looking to use our existing staff differently to supply some additional resources to the English department uh, and borrowing from a different department. So that's, that's still a hope, not a sure thing. Is that what I'm understanding correctly? Yeah, there's none of, none of it's a sure thing. Uh, there are also some other things that have changed recently that uh, could potentially make that process easier more likely, uh, but not, not anything that, it's a personnel issue, so we can't really uh, discuss that because it's attached to specific people. No, I, I understood, but I, I would just like to, as a part of the budget process, advocate for the replacement of that English teacher. And however that, you know, request is, I, I would like to, you know, see that happen. So I'm just putting a plug in as it were uh, as a part of this discussion, when we're talking about funds allocation, it might be appropriate to, to say at this point. Thank you. I, if I could also ask a question. Oh, I, I'd also like to uh, sort of 100% uh, support Lowe's hands reflections um, on the, uh, on that item. Um, and uh, could you detail, uh, so did I see uh, somewhere here that there was 287,000 of additional cuts? Something of that sort? Or 282? Yes, could you detail what those were? Sure, uh, we made some, we looked at some cuts in the technology department, um, as well as the assistant superintendent's uh, budget. Did, did you want more information than that? Uh, it, I, I guess it's a little hard to know what that, what that means or what, that's, what that says. Um, I mean, I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds. I mean, it, could you say a little more? So I, <laughs> I, I have, a, have a bit better of an understanding of, it's a, what you said was a little abstract. Sure. Um, in the te technology budget, we uh, looked at the equipment section um, and we cut some items out of that uh, budget that is just strictly uh, some equipment. Um, in the assistant superintendent, we budgeted for um, several hours of curriculum development um, and we just streamlined that area just a bit. So it's mostly uh, wages and uh, pension and FICA. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. So, so perhaps I could convey a general uh, comment, which is, uh, I mean, that sounds that sounds good to me. Uh, one area of, um, I'm not sure if concern is is the right word, but of uh, being able to convey the, the proper information is that. The board members have a very limited knowledge of when the cuts will actually be detrimental to the underlying quality of education and when they aren't. It's as a, we're relying on the, the expertise of the administration to convey that to us, that you know, this, you're putting us in a position where this cut would actually impact the quality of the education of the students, whereas this cut, not so much. And I see this as a recurring issue, both in this year's budget and going forward, where um, whereas board members were, were, were reliant on, on knowing that if we you know, approve a budget where you've gone through these cuts, that, that were we to have a, a, a slightly uh, higher tax rate or were we to go into fund balance a bit more, that what is the impact on the underlying quality of education um, that's a kind of analysis where we're very dependent on, um, 
uh, on hearing the administration convey that one way or the other. So, so if I understand what you just said in detailing that number is that, is it, it's both a comment and a question. Is, is this now the budget that the administration is recommending to us? And is it true that where you were able to prepare a budget with the parameters where you feel confident that there's not a serious impact on, on education itself to the students? Or is it the case that the English position, the library positions, that these are real costs, but they're costs that have to be borne given these parameters? So how should we be thinking about the nature of the costs as we decide on the approval of these of this budget with those parameters. I guess that's that's where the mo the most information we have on this uh, will help us enormously. I think. Okay. So first, I would say that yes, this is the budget that we would be recommending to the board for approval for the proposed final budget. Then there's one step further than that. Then we would uh, recommend the board approve a final budget. And as it sits right now. Uh, this is likely to be the uh, proposed and final unless the board um, changes either the tax increase or requests um, some additional changes. As to your second point, this is what I would say, Mr. Scalette. We currently have $1.3 million of federal funding that came from uh, COVID that is helping to balance this budget. Had we not added or got received the 1.3 million, the district would be looking at an additional $1.3 million. The total tax increase to the index only amounted um, to, uh, I believe it's, a $2.5 million increase um, over the current year's budget. That was, not, that was not going to cover the initial deficit that we started off with. Um, and so we are faced with many, many challenges. Um, those challenges are due to a variety of reasons. They are due to unmandated, unfunded mandates, uh, such as the pension, such as health healthcare, such as uh, cyber charter, we continuously outpace our expenditures in areas such as transportation and special education. And so we have those areas that we, we're faced with. And then we, before we open our doors on a day-to-day -day basis, we've already spent 80% of our budget. That's 70% in salaries and, and benefits, and then another 10% in debt service. Um, and so we're only left with this small bucket of money to which we have to uh, find resources to cover uh, without essentially hurting the education of our students. And while these cuts may seem substantial uh, to some, we, at the very best, our very best efforts is to try to find reduction, cost reductions that are as far as way of, away from children as possible that do not have a direct impact. However, there are challenges that we, we find ourselves with our uh, hands tied behind our backs because we only have but so many resources available to us. Um, and with BEF structured the way that it is, we're just not getting the state, we're not getting the support from the state that York Suburban is, should get. Um, I will also add that um, these challenges are not just challenges that we face today. There are challenges that we will face um, in years to come. And our hope and what we're trying to do um, by the small reductions that we've made is to make sure that we're not cutting programs. We're not looking at arts. We're not looking at music. We're not looking at those ancillary um, programs because we know that 
Um, when we're educating children, we have to consider the whole child. It's not only about reading and math, it's also about um, the talents of that child and educating them in, uh, in, in other areas. And so we're, we're benefiting right now, or we're lucky that we don't have to dig into those pots and look at those cuts. We're at a position right now where we can control some of these costs without having to furlough staff because it's a necessity. What we don't want to do is get to the point where it will become a necessity and we'll have to make those cuts in the future. And we won't have an option but to make those cuts because that's when it really starts to help uh, to hurt children. Thank you. So uh, if I could follow up then with one, um, uh, I would say concrete question, and, and that was all very, very helpful. Uh, there is a general concern I see when you look across the years that you're building in an assumption of maximum tax increases starting next year. And it's still a dire situation, right? That's worrisome. So yeah. now we've got a situation where we're presenting a budget that's not doing the maximum tax increase, mm -hmm. right? So we're, we're, we're choosing not to do the maximum tax increase, which pushes the need in the, in the following years. So it's like, it's like doing something now, which is not necessarily helpful for our future in that it will be even harder because we're, because we're taking a premise of maximum tax increases starting next year. So, okay, so here's, so then let me ask it as a, that's the context for why I'm asking the question. Is this really prudent to be doing 1.9 on a premise that we have to max out st starting next year? Okay, so the concrete question is this. Let's say we went from 1.9 to 2.9. That means $400,000 approximately from my understanding of prior meetings. Okay, so now with that extra $4,000, with that sh with, with that little marginal increase, and by little, I mean little relative to all the other numbers that you've been, you've been talking about, would that be a, gr a great help? Like what, what's the additional help that that $400,000 would provide given the dire situation we see in the years ahead? Or is it that this year that $400,000 would not have such a, a huge impact, you know? So I'm trying to get some sense of marginal benefit, marginal cost. It's like an additional $400,000. What would that do? Would that give much more than $400,000 at this point, given the personnel cuts or, or you know, it, so, so that's the concrete question. So this is, this is how I would answer, how I would answer this. Yes, it could, it could benefit. Um, and it, it would make things slightly better. But I have to say, Mr. Scalette, that it would make things slightly better temporarily um, because the problems still exist. We're still outpacing special education. We're still not, we still have unfunded mandates. We're still faced with um, a shortfall from the state. And so, what we've done or what the state has forced us to do is put, the, put that responsibility on the backs of our local taxpayers. And we can go on and on about how unfair that is to our local taxpayers and the lack of support that we're receiving from the state. But ultimately, it is our responsibility to put a, uh, a budget together, together that is physically responsible, not only for today, but also for the long term. And I would say that uh, there's a fine balance between raising taxes to the index continuously every single year, because at some point that's going to have a negative impact on our collection rate. We're already seeing that the demographics within York Suburban have been changing and they've been changing over the last 20 years. And so as we see that change, we'll continue to see that impact in our local revenues uh, bucket. Um, and I think that raising taxes to the index 
could have a long effect where we won't see a 97% tax collection year after year. We're going to see that decline. And every, for every percent, we're, we're losing about $400,000. And so that's a real concern. You have all of these uh, balls you have to juggle and making sure that you're, you're, you're keeping, one, your education or the education that we desire to, to provide to our student intact. So we have all of these things going on and you, you're right, what are the benefits? What are the pros and cons of not increasing taxes or um, you know, using fund balance? And I think that I've shown that over the course of this budget development, it is a fine balance. And, and I don't envy the board for having to make that decision, um, but it's one that we do not take lightly. None of these cuts we take lightly, um, but it's something that we have to do. And Kathy, if I, if I may, um, historically, when we've increased taxes to a, a higher percentage than what we're doing now, what has happened to the collection rate? Uh, there, there was one year uh, where we increased above the index, um, and that year we saw a 96% uh, tax collection, where in other years we were at 96%. Actually, it was a 93% tax collection where other years we were uh, between 95 and 97. So it went Do down. Do we know what year that was? I'm sorry. That wasn't the 2010-11 school year. It's included in the last uh, pre budget presentation. So would you say there's a correlation between higher levels of taxation and negative correlation to... Uh, collection rates? From what I can see on paper, it appears to be. Because I wasn't the CFO at that time, I wouldn't be able to say for sure. But just looking at the data, that was one of the things that stuck out to me. Well, I, let me jump in there. I, I, I don't know about one data point being a correlation, and, and I get it. That's a theory, but it also could prove the fact that raising taxes in a bad or, or worsening an economic environment is not the solution. We can look to the city to see how that works out so swimmingly. You can't keep increasing taxes on people and expect them to keep paying uh, and just keep shelling it out over time. It doesn't work. It fails 100% of the time. It fails, ultimately and people start moving out on the margin initially, and then the demographic continues shifting. So um, the one thing I do wanna to say to you, Kathy, is that has been the best overview I have heard out of your office in my tenure. Absolutely spot on, 100% correct. In fact, I think, Vince, if we can take that video and send it to every single legislator in the state, and play it over and over again. And if we could somehow send out the transcript of this, you encapsulated exactly what the problem is. It's an unfunded mandate from the state because it feels good and it gets people reelected. And here we are with little to no resources to help meet that budget gap other than tapping our existing taxpayers. And if we can't do that anymore, we've got to cut. And, and, and we're doing the best we can. But when I get letters like I've got to save a library position from certain legislators in our area, and I see editorials out there that say that we're not gonna fund schools that don't fully open and they don't provide the funding, that's not a solution. That's a political campaign. We're in a crisis right now and you're doing the best job you can. Now. Here's my concrete question now that I'll get off my soapbox. If we didn't have COVID and it magically disappeared next year, how much in terms of incremental expenses would go away? And it's not a gotcha question. If you don't have it, that's fine, but just ballpark. Well, I know one for sure, and that is the increase in cyber charter enrollment. Due to COVID, we have had to budget 180 students uh, for a cyber charter where usually we're averaging between 120, 130. So those extra students cost us 800, 000, close to $800,000 in this budget alone. 
Okay. In this budget alone. What about the what about the operational costs of the school? There isn't a lot that is factored into this budget. Another thing that is factored into this budget, which is part of our strategic plan, but because of COVID, we've had to accelerate that a little bit. And that is the development of TOP, our own internal online cyber program. We continue okay. to grow that. So that is another cost where if we were outside of COVID, we would probably take it as, you know, a little bit slower. Okay. Okay. So, so long story short, um, when we look at these mandates that come down or we look at what we're being forced to do, COVID-related, non-COVID-related, we're, we're, again, these are, these are more soft mandates that are coming through and we don't have the ability to recapture revenue on the other side because, again, it's just increase the expenses faster than, than the revenue and, and we're getting stuck again. So, um, you know, again, I, I applaud you for the efforts. You have a great understanding of exactly what's going on. I applaud you for, for um, uh, coming out and, and really laying it out. Um, I, hope, I hope there's reporters on this line. I hope there's legislators on this line listening to this, or I hope this gets shared on social media because this has got to stop. This has got to stop. We're, we're supposedly a top tier school district in the area. And we are facing mega, mega budgetary problems. And everybody can complain all they want and they can send the notes and they can do all their postings, but all they're doing is complaining. We're trying to come up with solutions and the solutions are sitting in Harrisburg. And unfortunately those people want, are more worried about getting reelected than they are about fixing the underlying problems. Thanks, Kathy. Well, just to I tag team on, on that, um, that's been the case for how many years, Kathy, where we keep getting these unfunded mandates over and over again. And, you know, it, it, it's not just our district that's having these issues. Um, I mean, I agree with you, James, that, you know, I'd like somebody to hear this who is able to, to make the changes that, that we need. Um, now, having said that, I've got a couple of questions regarding, you know, closer to home than this ethereal, gee, what Harrisburg does. Um, first of all, what concrete steps are we taking as a district to bring back some of these cyber uh, students? I I'd like down the road to see a concrete plan about what we can do. I know at one point there was a concerted effort to send letters comparing and contrasting our scores with the cyber scores and those kinds of things. I'm not saying necessarily that we need to do a repeat performance of that, but I would like to see us doing something rather than just throwing our hands in the air and saying, you know, we have to budget for more cyber students. No, so, that's that's a great question. And Dr. Krauser, I don't know if you're prepared to answer, but you've been working on a lot on this area. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I and wholeheartedly agree. It's certainly not a, a hands in the air to, to, to pass that budget on to, to Mrs. Chichuli's office. Uh, it has been an all hands on deck, certainly a lot of data collection, first and all, to find out um, purposes for going to a cyber charter. Um, we have, as you mentioned, Mrs. Uh, Schroeder, to um, look at um, available resources, comparing schools, and 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 the reasons for leaving are vast. Some have nothing to do with performance of a school. It's about the flexibility that a completely online program can offer them as a learner and their family. Um, so we have been making very personalized conversations. We've been making personalized calls, um, seeking to find out what what the need is that they're finding an alternative measure that we can't offer internally. Um, and it's been been with that to start, a very personal by nature that we're calling the individuals and speaking with them and, and asking the questions about what it is that we can offer here that would be able to recruit them back. And then how do we find, I'll say even intermittent solutions. How do we either adjust and be more flexible in an all in or all out model and support those students as they go through? Um, a lot of it too is tracking in students that are moving in from other districts that were already in a cyber program that as soon as they're arriving, um, we're, we're getting on them right away. So a lot of it for this, for this part of the year has been data collection. And as you can guess, 
there's still that mixed bag where we have some that are COVID related. So it's, it's, it's health related, um, but we are finding others that are more academic related. And how do we look at our existing programs and program designs to support that learning uh, model that they're seeking? Well, I look forward to getting a good, you know, detailed report on some of that data and learning more about that. I'm really glad to hear that's, that's ongoing. I had faith in you, Scott, that something was happening. I just didn't know what it was. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, second, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just get my second question in while I've got Dr. Krauser on the screen. Um, what I'd like to know what we've cut some of your curriculum development money. I, I understand from what Kathy has said. I'd like to know if we increase the budget just a tad because my antenna go up when we start talking about curriculum development. Mm -hmm. That directly impacts kids. And so I'd like to know what, what was in the offing and how are we gonna deal with you know, balancing that to miss out on that uh, curriculum development piece for the upcoming year? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and it was twofold. It was one, certainly by the board's um, will and approach to approve a school calendar that allowed us to add a little bit of time for teachers to work on curriculum during their contractual hours. So that was a help in that first direction. Uh, as, as Kathy mentioned, a lot of the dollars that were and the monies implemented for that, as you know, is curriculum development, which occurs outside of the contractual time. So it's summer development, it's um, outside of the school day development. So what we did was, um, Dr. Ketterman and I sat down and reassessed the entire school calendar to think about ways that we can build collaboration and time development inside the school calendar and activities that can be led, to be honest, by a lot of the administration um, to assist with that um, uh, so that it can be done outside of that contractual time. And then we can work with the teachers to kind of facilitate that development during those early dismissals in preparation for that spring PD time. So that was a big part of that. Um, the second piece of that development that we're missing is operationally moving our curriculum into a, a, a data warehousing system where we can um, access the curriculum in electronic form. Um, so right now, Dr. Cameron and I were working actually even um, as early as last week, looking at the calendar again to think about ways that we can use the instructional time or I'll say the contracted day um, to offset activities or um, duties or assignments, et cetera, to try to free up more time that can be accessed while the teachers um, are, are in school time. So that, that's kind of where the hit has come from that. And we're immediately trying to work on, on ways to work around it. So, so you as the curriculum, secondary curriculum uh, person in our district mm -hmm. can, can look us in the eye and say, in spite of these cuts, we have that curriculum development base covered. And at the end of the day, kids are not going to be impacted. I can say that for next year, we have a definitive plan to do that. But as Kathy had mentioned, it is not something sustainable that can happen um, long-term. Each one of these cuts, you know, as she mentioned, is a dip into the resources that we have to support the students for this year to make the decisions on how we are gonna get this budget to work. Um, but the need for the development of curriculum, which the, the high quality teaching learning is essential to the success of our students. We have to have an opportunity for the teachers to build design um, and edit and evaluate that curriculum outside of the time that they're working with a student. Um, so yes, I feel confident going into next year that we will not impact students. Moving forward, we're going to have to think of ways that we can utilize that time with student, with with teachers in curriculum development um, that's still in a fiscally sound way to do it. I, I'm, I'm still looking for that magic wand for, for next year and the next year and the next year, but I guess we need to look at, I mean, my thinking is we need to look at the year at hand. So mm -hmm. that's, that's primarily what I'm, you know, interested in knowing about, so. Correct, and, that, and that's really what we did when the, when the numbers, um, looked, we, we really kind of assessed the, the current calendar. Um, you know, we had charged the administrators to step up on some changes and how they're designing their, their, their individual goals for the year and how we're integrating that with collaboration in the time. Another example, Dr. Kevin had worked to adjust the schedule for, for elementary to try to tease out more time for teachers to be working with um, the written curriculum so we can ensure accountability in the taught curriculum as well. 
Okay. Th thanks very much to, to both you, Scott and to Kathy. Thank you. Absolutely. I guess I have to chime in here as the person that's been around here for the longest listening to all of everybody worrying about uh, unfunded mandates. Uh, James, let me assure you that for all my years here, that's been the number one thing that we have tried to share with legislators time and time again, that every time they ask us to do something, um, they fund it for a year and then we turn around and they don't want to fund it anymore. And that um, uh, charter schools is a perfect example when they got, when they first approved charter, the uh, development of charter schools, they were giving us a, a reasonable uh, amount back on each tuition that we paid. Um, now they, they're giving us nothing and no help with that. But um, for some reason, the people in Harrisburg, they, the people get up there and they don't want to hear what's happening down here in their districts. And uh, they're not here to see the tax collections. They're not here to, to hear some of these conversations that we're having about, you know, school nurses, librarians, curriculum development. It's all, you know, this makes life really tough on the ground when we want to maintain the kind of rigorous curriculum that we have here at York Suburban or in any of the school districts in, in the Commonwealth very, very difficult, you know, and this year has been particularly difficult given having to, to deal with, um, uh, with COVID and, and the constant in and out and changing uh, of the school day and, of, uh, and where the students are virtual or they're home or they're in quarantine. So I think, you know, it, it, uh, Rich Robinson, this is where you step in and say, yep, we're gonna go after these legislators and we're gonna talk to them and we're gonna pound them and we're gonna pound them and we're gonna pound them, gonna pound them about unfunded mandates. Ask, ask a legislator what they're gonna to do to cut their staff if their budget was cut or there was an unfunded mandate. I guarantee you they tell you they can't cut their staff because it's too important. Well, so is our staff, all of our staff, whether it's the, the classroom teachers or the custodial staff uh, uh, or the uh, people in the offices. You know, it takes a lot to run, to run this big village. And, uh, but I think this is something that we just have to keep pounding and pounding and pounding away on, on legislators to let them understand that the money does not grow on trees. It is not a, a bottomless pit. And uh, our taxpayers are looking for, uh, for relief from the state and, and more help, that's for sure. Thank you. So um, I'd just like to say that I, uh... I really appreciate what you as administration have brought to us here. I appreciate uh, you know, that you are getting creative on how to fund uh, and use the time that you have. And, and you know, what you just talked about, Dr. Krauser, with the curriculum development might not be sustainable, but looking at doing things different to get more, more bang for the buck, I, I applaud that, that we are thinking um, outside of our norms and, and coming up with creative solutions and getting us to a much better place than I thought we would be tonight um, on this budget. Um, you know, I trust you guys. You, you know the mission at hand and you know that you don't want to sacrifice the children's education here. And you're making the tough decisions that you need to make. And, and, and I appreciate it. This is the beginning of lots of tough decisions because we're gonna come back and make a whole lot of tough ones next year too. Um, but I appreciate that we're getting in the right frame of mind. Uh, and, and I just wanna, wanna say that. I also wanna say that as far as the top program goes, um, I, I think that that needs to be looked at as a, as a business plan. Because you know what we, coming into this, if we hadn't had COVID, we would have wanted top to, transfer those dollars that were leaving our district for cyber schools to keep them those dollars in our district. And we still want that. The, the problem is just a lot bigger now because of COVID and, and everything that's going on. So we really need to look at that as a business plan. How do we how do we get those hundred, you know, those 180 kids back that at the very least there are 180 kids in our cyber program. So the dollars are not going outside. Um, and we're saving that money. So I appreciate that. I don't need any answers to any questions, but um, I just think that you guys, I, and I know you're looking at it that way. I appreciate it. I think, um, you know, we're making good progress here. I'm, I'm very happy with where we're at on the budget. Thank you. Kathy, the COVID relief money that's coming, the learning catch up part of that, 
Will we have the ability to use any of that for our curriculum? Uh, yes. So in the ESSER, in the SF3, there is 20% of, of the money that has to be set aside for learning loss. And so we know we have that. Um, and you're correct. We can we could use more. Um, so we're looking at a combination of, you know, top learning loss, some curriculum development, and then some facility projects um, in the 22-23 school year. So we're going to have to use that over two years, right? And then it goes away. So right. we've, got, we've got to have a plan. To... Correct. Can somebody tell me there, there was at one point legislation pending that if a district had a cyber program, those oh, students, yeah. we wouldn't have to pay for those students because we had a program in-house. Did that just fall by the wayside? Is that, do you know, Rich? Do, am I speaking French? Do we know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. It's in the uh, legislative black hole, void, however you want to describe it. So it's not going to happen is the long and short of it? Well, I don't want to say that, Lois Ann. I mean, uh, since I was mentioned by name by one of my colleagues, let me just add that, you know, all the stuff we're talking about and we're expressing our indignation, we've got to translate that into votes. Because I think that's what these guys understand, especially the... Um, the legislature, legislator who sends us self-righteous letters about retaining library positions. And may I take this opportunity to share with you all that several of my colleagues and Dr. Williams wrote to said legislator and pointed out the folly of his correspondence. And I think we need more of that. And we need it constantly. And it's got to be a drumbeat, as Mrs. Freyrich said, but it's got to be more than one guy. It's got to be the entire board. And if I may extend that thought, we've got to talk to our friends and associates throughout our community to let them know that if we just sit on our thumbs, we'll go down. We have a good program, a superior program. It cannot be sustained under the current situation. And if we just let things go on the way they are, we will lose ground, period. I may be exaggerating, but you all know me. That's what I do. Thank you. So so the legislation then is not, it's not like this is something we're going to see happen in the next legislative year. Am I concluding that? I, I would bet that we'll see hell freeze over first, but. <laughs> that's why I love you, Rich. Thanks. That's, that's a technical <laughs> term, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. I have one more question on the on the budget for this year. Um, I, I had two concerns, but I want to put one aside for this question and take for granted the size of the pie. And then the question is how to balance the use of fund balance versus uh, tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I, it's really a prudential concern about looking at a five year window. Isn't there some sense in saying? And this is this is symbolic more than anything, uh, but not entirely symbolic to say we ought to be using no fund balance this year. So we should set the tax rate at whatever it is that will give us a zero use of fund balance, which would put it at you know 2.1 or 2 point whatever, because the idea is it's pay now or pay later. So there's just something a little painful about using any fund balance at all, because you can see in our budget protections, the fund balance is gonna go away. It's like, we need every dollar for future fund balance usage um, so I just throw that out there for, I guess, uh, for the finance committee and, and, and if the administration has a reflection on it, it strikes me that there's an argument to be made that, that we peg a zero fund balance usage and the tax rate compatible with that. Well, let, let me just jump on that one for a minute. Kathy, again, just to clarify, use of fund balance um, for pensions was set up specifically to be used over about a 10 year period of time at $300,000 a year. That was a commitment we made to the taxpayers. Every penny we have in fund balance, whether it's designated or undesignated, is 
sourced from taxpayers somewhere. It either comes from federal, state, or local taxpayers. And we know in our case, more than 70% of it comes from local taxpayers. It is a pre-collected expenditure. We're building an account that we can use for purposes, in this case, designated specifically to cover increases in pension. As high as those numbers are, Steve, they're, they're not going up dramatically anymore. So I think it's prudent to make good on our promise to use at least that piece of it for our taxpayers. That's what we set it aside for. It's what, we, what we've uh, represented to taxpayers for years now. And I think it's on us to use it for that purpose. So I would say at least that piece of it, we should, we should maintain a commitment to use that piece of fund balance and not shut it off. That is not our money to use any, any way we want. It's our money to use prudently to extinguish some of these, these pension costs. That's what it's for. And I'm not sure if I, if I missed the detail, Kathy, have we actually used all of it? We have not. We have not. So we could actually increase the use of fund balance slightly and we could, under the budget that was presented, reduce the tax rate from, say, 1.9 to 1.8. Well, now, what are our budget? What what is our budget cost for pensions? I don't want. I, I was with you there for a minute, Joel, but then when you start saying reduce, uh, that that bothers me. So, what if we? This money is allocated for pensions. What's in our budget? Help me with that figure, Kathy. Sure. That's the only one thing that I didn't have ready. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, well so are you are you asking for the total amount of, of pension? Well, if we have three hundred thousand dollars allocated from our fund balance, designated, mm -hmm. earmarked for pension costs, does pension that cost cover, increases? Right. Does that cover our pension cost increase, or do we need more? Because I'm sort of in the same of the same mindset with. Uh, Steve Scalette, so why, if we're going to, next year, going to have to go the full gamut of our uh, of amount, highest amount possible, why aren't we sort of splitting the difference, so to speak, this year, so it doesn't have to be so much next year, say? I I'm just seeking information here, but I, I kind of get that, that uh, thought process there. I, th I think that the big assumption in this spreadsheet is that there are votes out there to raise taxes to the max every year for the next four years to even hit that target that we talked about. Couple that, John, with the assumed flat funding. Right, right. In the state and the federal government. And that, that's, that's certainly a doomsday projection. I doubt the, it the, the, pro the projection we've got there is the most optimistic projection that Kathy could do probably. Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think an optimistic, maybe unrealistic, but an optimistic projection might take an average of the increases in the last five years and use them rather than a flat funding yeah. as a best case. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, so I, I think, I, I think take into account pretty much status quo. Yeah, and, and, and I think the thing that concerns me is, you know, educational quality is their driver. But if we go out and we find $100,000 $100, in additional taxes, then the discussion is going to shift to, well, who can we hire? So we've added additional load to the budget instead of solving this red ink problem. Somehow we've got to figure out both of those. We can't well, just or, add or position. In the immediate future, John, the solution is if you find the money, you use it to fund the shortfall. You don't go create more shortfall. Well, and I think that goes without saying. I mean, I think people know that. I mean, no, it's I, I, I don't know. I'm not so sure that our behavior true. would bear that out necessarily, Lois. And that well, I think the nine people we sitting we're around our table out. certainly know that. I don't know. Yeah, but Lois, we're going to have we're going to have at least one new face coming on board uh, in December. Well, I, I'm just I, I'm just saying, I, I think I personally, I'm a little insulted when we start talking about if we have too much money, then, oh boy, how do we spend it? That's, that's no, 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 I, I don't think he's saying that, Lois. No, I, I didn't think say that he's at saying all. is we have short memories on, on where to plug the gap. I mean, we can't, we, coming out of 08, 09, 2010, 
and we're building new schools and, and putting things in place, you know, in that 2012, 2013 timeframe, that, that spells short memory to me. I, I think, I think what, what Joel's getting at here, and, and I don't want to speak out of turn for you and John is, is it, it really, you know, deep thought needs to go into this because this isn't like a one-off budget change. This is a trend and it's a trend that's, that's escalating. Understood. Uh, you know, the other thing we're not taking into account either is, you know, we've got two large nonprofit entities that sit in our district that keep swallowing up property, right? So, I, so not only do we have to watch what we're doing here, but we have to watch what happens at the township and zoning level as well. Because you know what? If they if they rezone or LERDAs come into play, we're going to continue to lose more land to those nonprofit entities. And guess what happens? Our tax base goes down. You've heard the phrase preaching to the choir, Mr. I'm Sanders. with you. I'm with you. Uh, this is Steve Sullivan. I wanted to uh, asso associate myself with um, uh, Steve Scalette's uh, remarks and Lois Ann's remarks uh, regarding why it is we might be pulling punches at all uh, on the tax uh, uh, increase, looking at what we're looking at, you know, through 2016. Um, I, I know that nobody in this meeting is going to relax until the five or further year out forecasts don't show any negative numbers, don't show any exhaustion of the fund balance. Um, so, but but I do I do sort of have the same question about why we would why we we would say it's a three hundred dollar set aside for pension increases this year when we all know that the depletion of the fund balance is going to be more than that next year and why we would be worried about some sort of laugher curve like phenomenon with the pushing rates past the index and the total tax take going down that discussion that was had earlier um, when we're still talking about having it at the maximum the other however many years are in the budget. So, you know, if we're worried about it happening now, why aren't we worried about it happening then, I guess is my point. So I, I don't know why we're not, um, uh, I don't know why we're not talking about more. I understand John's point about, you know, look, we had a 1% increase. And I've said this myself before, we had a 1% increase that passed by one vote. So, you know, we, that happened last year. So we do have to stay realistic about, about these sorts of things. But um, I think the possibilities uh, I, 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 I'm not going to feel comfortable, you know, even after we think that we're going to solve this problem, we still have negative numbers on this five-year forecast, which I think that we do. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure, um, that going with anything less than, uh, the maximal increase we could potentially get away with is going to, is going to solve that problem. I tend to think it's more than 1.9%, I guess is all I'm saying. So the net increase in just pension, net meaning half of the pension liability is covered by the state, is 175925 That's what our increase for 21-22. So we would actually be using more than our increase. So then this, this uh alleged commitment to the community to only use that money for um, pension costs is we're using more than what we need, is, if I'm understanding correctly. We're well, using, it was, we're using what we committed to use. So. Right. Okay. I, and we, I don't know the numbers, Kathy, but it could have been in the, in, in the first few years where we made that commitment that the increase in pension was greater than what we allocated. I don't know. And maybe at some point you could give us that number. We start talking about X number of dollars per year. It's typically an average. And that was how we did our planning. We've done the same sort of thing with healthcare to try to build a healthcare reserve. Right. And right. those are prudent steps. But right. when, when it comes to being the taxpayer, and I think we all need to stop for just a minute and consider what happens if, for example, we go with a 3% or this year, or whatever, what is it, three, six, if we go to the max? Yes. And we take the uh, IFO's numbers, which are in the 3% range for the next five years, mm -hmm. you know, com compounds to about 20%. And that is not a one-time thing. That's a forever increase in the base. 
Isn't it's that wonderful also, for us? That's just great for us. Would you like to have your taxes raised 20%? That's it's, also for, it's also forever in the budget, monies to be used for the good of the cause. I understand that, Lois Ann, and I'm not questioning that. I'm, I'm simply saying there are two sides to this. Understood. There's scarcity on both sides of this. Understood. To think that we can continue to take things, bites of two and a half, three, three and a half percent, year after year after year, because we are absolutely unwilling or unable or whatever to roll this rock hard enough uphill to get something done. Every school district that raises taxes to the max is telling Harrisburg, you don't have to do anything. It's a horrible position to be in. But unless we collectively say to Harrisburg, we won't do this anymore. We won't put more pain in our tax base. We simply will not. And with you're going to have to deal with that, Harrisburg. If we start laying teachers off because we can't afford them, then you're going to have to deal with your friends in the PSEA to see what sort of um, deal you can strike with them. Until we start making it hurt, we're going to continue to have this conversation, and that's all there is to it. And in the long run, it's the students in the school district who take it on the chin, because and my opinion leverage. is the Harrisburg people could give a rat's patootie about our kids. So are we saying that that's the leverage they have and we can't do anything about it? I'm saying we, we need to raise the taxes about. more than 1.9% is what I'm saying. For how long? I'm not saying that? we need to go to 3.6, but I'm saying we need to raise it more than 1.9. That's what I'm saying. I'd, I'd like to say that we cut it by a tenth of a percent to show our taxpayers that we're trying to help them as well. That when we that gave parameters, we gave parameters to the, to the administration and they've come through big time. You got to have five votes. Either way, Joel, you got to have five votes. And gotcha. I'm aware of that. I'm okay. just speaking my mind. Uh, Mr. Talk Sears, about I the well-being and the sustainability. And we're, we're doing everything in our power to punch a hole in the boat. If we start talking seriously about 3% tax increases indefinitely. Mr. Sears, I would like to say that I, I agree with you that if we're raising taxes, we're raising taxes to solve this problem, not to accommodate nonsense. Um, I have so no, no, please forgive me if that's what your, what your interpretation was. No, I, 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 we're not trying to signal to the folks in Harrisburg that we are going to accommodate whatever it is they want to do. With tax increases, and I and I think that was part of the point that you were making. What, and I think what do you think we're telling them, Steve? Well, I I think the point you were you were cautioning us against adopting a position that we are willing to shell out money for whatever it is they come up with, and I am saying that, in as much as you were making that argument, I agree with you. <laughs> and so the question is, is that part of the conversation, or do we just have to forget that? Because if we don't tax to the max, it hurts our kids. And we'll just delay the conversation and the pain another year. Is there no compromise? Do we don't have to go to the max? That's not you what know, I'm saying. I thought the I compromise think was the point really last year. Whether we go to the max or stay where we are, we really don't solve the problem. This is like the minimum wage argument. We're not solving the problem if we meet in the middle. It is absolutely like the minimum wage ar argument. We, need we a have a number of constituents here, and, and I get that we're trying to educate the kids, and that is, that is what our mission is here, but we have taxpayers that have to pay it. So to go to the max, I agree with Mr. Sears. We're telling Harrisburg, it's okay. We figured it out again this year. Maximum pain with very little to show for it in terms of structural reform. And five years from now, we'll have the same conversation, except our tax base will be 20% higher. Our tax rate will be 20% higher. I'm not sure that I agree with you, Joel. I mean, we could, we could argue about this all day, and that's not what my objective is. But I think okay. we made some really serious sacrifices. Uh, three uh, professionals, for example. Uh, curriculum development cuts. We, we've done a lot 
And I, I don't think, I, I think it's a little uh, unfair to say we've done nothing. I think they've made some, the administration has done a good job with, and has made some serious cuts. I, for one, am ready to say, okay, good job. Rather than go 1.9, let's go two and a half. I mean, what is, you know, well, I guess the question is whether, is this the appropriate time to have that conversation or do we go to the full board even though we're all here? Well, I think it's, it comes down to budget. To me, this is the perfect opportunity to have this discussion. Not that we're going to fix it now, but we can certainly have a discussion about it and know where people stand. Well, As I, I said that. earlier, we have to have five votes, whatever the, the decision is. So, I, sense, All right, for what it's worth then, since we can't vote in this body, we can push this to the next board meeting where we can vote and we can discuss and determine the tax rate at that point. Yeah, what we'll need, we'll need a motion that says we propose the tax rate to be X and then we can argue over it and we can change the, the, the number mm -hmm. or do whatever, but that has to be through a motion. Well, I mean, I'm not on finance, so I'm not on the finance committee. I'm just a lowly board member. So but I'm you have you, you have the same voice we all do at the board meeting. And oh, you still okay. have a voice here, Lois Ann. Got it. I, well, you notice I'm not shy. And you shouldn't be. I mean, the, the point of attending these meetings isn't just to sit back and look. And I'm just frankly, as, as the chair of this committee, thrilled that all board members show up for these meetings. But rather than have the same discussion twice, why don't we move this to the board where we can actually take official action on it? Just so that we know we don't have to vote on a tax increase in April. We certainly do have to do that in May, but that's not necessary in April. We can hold off until all you're, pro all you're doing at the April 12th meeting is adopting a proposed final budget. We still have one more step to go. Understood. Well, is there not yeah, merit is... in, in running numbers, getting a proposed budget for 1.9 and a proposed budget for another figure uh, between now and then? Is there no merit in, in, in doing that? I'm asking. I, I certainly don't know. I mean, we, we have the tax scenarios. So it's just a matter of taking that and, and applying the expenditure budget to it. Well, the conversation we've had in the last several minutes really doesn't relate to expenses, correct? It's revenue related. Right. And, you know, without oversimplifying, we all have a pretty good handle on what these percentage increases do in, in the way of revenue or fractions thereof. So if you run the exhibit that you have right now, is that what you're looking at as the proposed final budget? The, uh, you, what's attached to the agenda? Yeah. That's well, just revenues and expenditures. So what I will be proposing to you is the actual budget in, in detail. Correct, but the bottom line is what you've shown us today. Correct. Correct? Correct. And is the proper label the proposed final budget? Yes. Is that something you're going to present on the 12th? Yes. And what's the board action at that time? Is there a vote on that? There is. And it's just to approve the proposed final at that expenditure um, mm -hmm. number. So 62. Uh, $63,012,937 with what looks to be essentially a balanced budget for the year. Yes, at a 1.9% increase a using $300,000 of reserve. Yes. Well, I see no reason why that can't go as proposed. Committee? And then to Lois's point to have at some point yeah. in the near future, an opportunity to see what happens with certain increases and maybe even certain small decreases. Does it make sense to have that food fight at the next meeting while we we're can... approving this? Oh, I think so. I think this is, if you're gonna do it, because if we wanna put out our 
proposed final because budget. If we, if we accept a proposed budget, the newspapers are going to say, York Suburban has a budget, and then we're going to come back in two weeks and change or not. So I'd say let's have the fight Monday night. Well, can't we have a multiple choice? I like this one and you like that one and see who gets five votes. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta start with one and one's gotta pass or fail or you have to amend that motion. It's just kind of the way it works. We can't put three on the table and, and pick. But we can have it in our hip pocket, John. That's Kathy, what I'm asking. Numbers? Kathy, I won't have, have those, those numbers. numbers. We'll have I the won't numbers. have the numbers. Yeah, we, we, well, you had them on that last slide. So. Yes. So yeah, what number will you use? I will, I, will, I will give you the different revenues at the different tax rates okay. minus the expenditures, and then you'll see the deficit or the surplus. Because the board, the board just accepted the proposed budget as is. It has one nine. So that will be the first one that comes out that you right. will have to make a motion to amend that will be voted on, and then we'll have the food fight. Okay, sense. so what I what I said, you guys thought I was, you know, being clever, and I wasn't a multiple choice. I mean, you, in effect, you want to vote down one point nine. Yep, it's the starting point, correct? Okay. Because and I, let's I, just I, speculate I, that it fails six three. That doesn't mean that there are six people in favor of a tax increase. Right. It means there are six people who don't want a one nine, which could mean that you know they want one four. <laughs> and that's, that's, they want two five. Correct. That's right. correct. We'll see how we have the illustrations to help us through that food fight. Uh, okay, that's uh, because what Kathy said. I, I, maybe I misunderstood. I thought Kathy said, "Well, you're only approving a a, a proposed budget." But yeah, we are. We're just approving. Yeah. We don't have to approve the tax rate at the April meeting. We can wait to do that on, in May, but. Since we want to have the discussion, we'll have it in well, this think, meeting. To John's point, since that budget has a tax assumption in it, it's not unreasonable for reporters to infer that that's the rate we're approving. Or well, the you're public, only, right. You're only, you're only approving the expenditure budget. That's the only line item that you're approving. You're not okay. approving... Okay. Right. Right. The revenue see, budget. I, I got you. I see the. So, so we could postpone the fight. <laughs> Pardon me? We could, but we could I'll, I'll have the numbers available right. and we can have that discussion. On so, Monday. All right, make, make sure that the old bald guy understands then what we're going to be approving is a proposed final expenditure budget. Yes. Not a right. proposed final budget. And then, then the rest of them, we can do whatever it is John wants to do, have his food fight, or just calmly talk about it, like, you know. No, I, I, I think runner. that was a critical distinction. Thank you. Does this mean we're not going to have a fight? Oh, yeah, we'll have a fight. <laughs> well, I, uh, to that point, it won't if I be may. The whole menu, Rich. It'll just be the appetizers. Well, I have a question on that front. Uh, first of all, I object to the idea of it being a food fight. <laughs> Considering the passion that we've heard tonight, can't we describe it as a barroom brawl with all the lights shot out? Boy. <laughs> and if we do, if we're anticipating this kind of frank and serious discussion, is there any merit to extending pointed invitations to our legislative compadres and their staffs to attend this meeting, to hear the passion exchanged? All it takes is a Zoom link. My good friend James Sanders is nodding with alacrity. I take it as a, a yes. So as legislative liaison, I will volunteer to extend said invitations. Yes, you want them no? on... You want them on Zoom or you just want them to come and join? Oh, I, I want them on camera. Yeah, <laughs> you go. Well, and preferably we'll invite all of our friends so that we can tell these guys that there's a cast of thousands attending the meeting and they all vote. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Okay. With, with that, with that, I think we probably beat this topic not to a pulp but enough <laughs> so this we'll is going to be fun passion for further discussion on monday let's again, talk about realignment we're talking time. about monday specifically then is the expense budget <laughs> right and i appreciate john making that uh clarification and uh, and for what it's worth you know i 
I actually don't see it as a food fight at all, seriously. I, I feel like we have a lot of agreement and actually what we're disagreeing on is very marginal. It's like, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so that's my, that's my two cents. And, and see, I, I, guess, I guess I am, I am less concerned about the percentage of the increase as I am about the, the rigor in which we look at additions, mm -hmm. you know, you know, if you just want to rip the scab off of my wound, you know, I mean, we just gave the faculty a 2% increase just because, which is 1% tax increase. So then we turn around and we argue over, well, we don't want to lose these positions. That's going to come up again. You know, our superintendent's going to come to us halfway through the year and say, it's critical for the grades that we have these two added positions. And that's going to happen for the next four years. So Every time we raise taxes, we add positions so we never catch up on where we're going. But that's just the cynical observation. Well, and it's the reality of the, of the institution that we're yeah. serving. If I may, Mr. Posnow, the recent 2% is part of a grander strategy. Okay, yeah. Okay. And when I have a little for that bridge. I beg your pardon? <laughs> when do I sign up for that bridge in New York? It's yours whenever you want it, man. It's been in the family <laughs> for years. Well, all right. I, again, I think we've probably beat this thing to death. And I'd like to, to thank everybody for the spirited discussion this evening. And I uh, hope that we can continue something as productive on Monday. So I think with that, I'd like to take a few seconds of my report just to, to adjourn the meeting. And just keep an eye on your emails for the next date and time. Thank you, everybody.